Okay, so we're gonna hide those uh, answers, and we'll now. Who wants to work this first one out? Be brave. Yes. Oh, oh, man. I got dibs on the second one. Already. Dibs. Dibs. Wow. Oh, oh, Cares enough to call dibs. I respect yeah. it. As long as I get my little. Max. Oh, don't respect that. it. Okay. Don't no. raise that. I'm still on it, but I don't respect it. steps are correct, probably that would be quickly how you would do it uh, in your head or in your notes or something. I just want to be technical so that you're not confused at all. Um, first, I think, can I fix this? Yeah, I can. So I'm lock it in place. Just lock all this stuff. Okay, where'd that go? <laughs> <laughs> what happened? What is that? technical about it is that is this function the same as this function when you cross out those common factors are the functions the same no. no what's not the same about them the limit is not a whole. what's not the same the function the, the function but what makes them different what makes them different functions the the little thing the point that's a whole the whole person. right this has a whole and this does not so they're not the same function but Ryan what is the same just well, they both need limits they both, the, the limits that they have, all of the limits that they have are all the same. Any limit, so specifically the limit as x approaches 4 is the same, for sure. Okay, so it's, the, the technical thing I wanted to point out is that the, the thing that's the same is the limit, not the function. So, be careful about that. I'm going to shrink this big down. Okay, tie it in. Is up. Here we go, tie it on. Don't mess it up. So you gotta do the conjugate. Limit equal. Okay, any technical time. Don't do it. Alright, this is rough. Shut up. <laughs> Let Tyner do his thing in peace. Oh, Who's directed for Polly? Yeah, let's not direct anything to anybody except for our attention. Okay, very nice work. Can't really read it. The only 
everything, though? Yeah, you know, if we're, if we're going to share the work publicly, then that would be some good things to do. If that's the work on your paper, that's perfectly great. Uh, so, something to keep in mind. When I'm working that out, I make sure to write that the limits of the things that are the same. When I write equal between each step, I'm writing limit. The limit is the same, not the function. Um, so, how do you Okay, so we have uh, two typical situations. Uh, both of them are going to have us canceling something between the numerator and the denominator. One of them is going to have us factoring to do that, the other multiplying by the conjugate. Um, any questions about that? Any um, homework questions you felt like were in that realm but didn't get covered? Yeah. Everybody's agreed on 67 or 68? <laughs> Okay, so this is this is my fault. For 67 and 68, it's, it's not too difficult, okay? Just, but if you're talking, it becomes a little difficult for me not to yell at you. So uh, 67 and 68 require us to know a couple of things. Well, they don't require it. We can prove these things ourselves, but probably didn't. On page 65, uh, there are two special trigonometric limits. One involving the sine of x over x, and it's limited as x approaches 0. And one of 1 minus cosine x over x, as x approaches 0. So if you look there on that page, uh, the, the limit of the sine of x over x is, as x approaches 0 is 1. And there's a nice little proof right there. You can read it and enjoy it. Um, but otherwise, all we really need to know, we uh, make a little sidebar here. Huh. 67, let's say, and, and 61, is gonna, or 68 is going to be very similar. So it's the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 over, uh, is it 1 over? No, it's sine of x over 5. Ah, yes, sine of x over 5. Sine of x over 5x. Well, if you look on page 65, there's the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x over just x. Okay. And the thing that we're trying to uh, get your minds to stretch and, uh, and uh, wrap around is the properties of limits, and that if you add the limits of two functions together, the limit is the sum of their individual limits. The, the limit of a function divided by a constant is just the limit that you already know divided by that constant. Right? Or in this case, the limit as x approaches 0 of, of, a, of sine of x over 5x can be written as the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 fifth times sine of x over x. And the property says that we can essentially just take the one-fifth out here. Right? And that makes sense, because as, zero, as x approaches 0, the only thing changing is this part right here. This part is a constant multiple. This part is a constant multiple. This part is, what is this getting closer and closer and closer to as x gets close to 0? One. 1, right? So there you go. Here we have this part is approaching 1. We have 1 times 1 fifth. Which is 1 fifth. Which is just 1 fifth. Oh, okay. And so you knew it was 1 fifth at the beginning just because when it's saying sine x over 5x, uh -huh. you just knew that like things that sine x over x equals 1, yeah. and then it's just over 5, then, yeah. okay. And you just you kind of recognize that pattern, keep an eye out for it. Okay. And so for like 68, would it just equal 0 then? 
68 would it equal zero? Yeah. Uh, because well, we'll do that one real quick. 68 is the limit as x approaches zero of what? It's three parentheses, one minus cos x, end of parentheses, over What's x. this? Cosine x. Cosine Time has come. Or you to always say this correctly. Over what? X. Over x. Okay. And so Bing's uh, one minus cosine x yeah. over x is zero, and you yeah. multiply that by three. Just multiply that by three, yeah. So you get okay. zero. There you okay. Go. okay. That makes sense. Okay. okay. Sorry, I didn't mention that. Um, okay. So these ones about continuity, we will look at these again. Um, but in a, in a new context, but it's the simplest way we could just have an understanding of continuity to recognize it if we see it is if we can draw the function without picking up a pencil. Yes, without picking up a pencil, exactly. <laughs> okay, you can do that with this one. You can just draw like this and no problem, right? There's a hole right there, sort of. It's like it's filled in with a point. You can kind of think of it that way. There's no, yeah, there's no equation for this. So it just goes right through that point. It's continuous. We don't have to pick up our pen or pencil or whatever. But this, <laughs> I come down to do. here, stop at the hole, fill in this guy right here, come back down here, and go the rest of the way. So not continuous. You know what uh, continuous means. You have a notion of, is it so continuous? Is that a word that you Yes. OK. Um, so just your general notion of continuous, something being always continuing, continual, whatever, uh, it makes sense why this visually is continuous and this is not. Okay. Uh, and that's all I wanted you to get out of that for the quiz. All right, so I have your quizzes. Um, homework. Let's, yeah, let's do homework. As you're passing in your homework, I'm just going to go to the next slide here. And how do you work on these? You're going to have you work on them individually with no calculator. Because that's what these questions are like on the AP test. Can you use calculators on On some of them, on oh. other ones you can. So no calculators, individual, no talking to each other, not yet. See what you can determine.
talk to other people, see what they've done and what their ideas are. Yeah, me too. That's all. Just for the first time. I just did the zero. I multiplied it in the middle. Zero. I just did one over it. 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 I just did one
uh, maybe you just stumbled upon it. But if you think about it before we even add them together or subtract them or whatever, um, it sounds like a good idea because think of all of the limits that we found so far and the problems that we fixed. They've all been some form of a fraction uh, where the numerator has a common factor with the denominator and something cancels and that's how we're able to find the limit. So it's not a fraction right now. Maybe we can make the whole thing together in one fraction and, and something will happen. Right? Okay. So let's try to put these guys together. Okay, so now the question is, can, um, I guess, somebody's trying to just add H to this? Something like that? Okay. Well, you'd have, it, maybe you could, but you'd have to justify it mathematically. Like, what did you do to that, that, um, that fraction to get a plus H in the denominator? Other than just writing plus H, what did you do? <coughs> you have to put on the oh, don't you? Yeah, it seems to be going somewhere. I multiply it. But my question though is, if we were to just add an h to the denominator, if this one, so it looks the same as that one, how does that happen? How do you get a plus h into the denominator of a fraction? You have to add onto the numerator too. Okay, yes. now we're, we're kind of stuck in a place of, I, I, I memorized that there is something about doing the same thing to the numerator and denominator. Yeah, it only works in multiplication. Okay, so, right, like if I have this, this fraction, you, and, you, and you just add h, you gotta ask yourself, how do we get there? How do you mathematically get the plus h to be there? You have to get a one to add one. You have to go. To get there to be a plus h down there, it turns out to be trickier than you would think. Like, how do you affect the denominator? You can, um, you could add something to this, to this fraction if you wanted to, but think about adding fractions, we should know that they don't, the denominators don't change when you add fractions. Okay. Uh, we can multiply fractions, okay. Okay, so maybe you multiply x by something to get x plus h. Um, it's possible, but probably not um, clean, clean as it, could, as it could be, right? All right. So the thing is, what I'm trying to point out is, when you try to do something, and you, you change uh, uh, one of the terms here, in some way, ask yourself how you did it, and ask yourself, does that make sense mathematically? Okay. And we're not going to just memorize uh, how to do things, but we're going to think that, okay, I'm constantly, when I'm doing things, if I question it at all, even 1% of a question, I make sure to run through it, and okay, yep, 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 all, those are all legal moves, uh, it all makes sense, I know I'm allowed to do that, okay, but if you just put a plus H in there, be ready to justify it, and I don't think that you can, because you don't know how you got it there other than shoving it in there, right? So to find common denominators, yes. The, the only simple way to change a denominator is to multiply the denominator by something else, right? right? And then there's where Ryan's comment comes in. If you multiply the denominator by something, which is a way you can change the denominator, is, well, you gotta multiply the numerator by the same thing, right? Because if we multiply just the denominator by something, and now it's not the same as it was. It's not equal to what it was to start with. Can you do like the thing where you take like the right part like the x and distribute that into like the left one over x plus h and the x plus h into the right like x plus h? Like so you're saying what x from the one minus or one over x? Oh. Yeah. And put like that like one times x and x plus h times x on the left part of the problem, and then take the x plus h from that and multiply that by the one. Well, I'm going to answer your question whether or not you can do that with, with all information that you have in your head or anything, right? Uh, I'll just ask you, so you want to know, it's like that, is that the right thing to do? Is that the good thing to do? Is that the smart thing to do? That kind of stuff. Whether you can do it, that's the important thing. And if it becomes useful after you're done, well, then it was a good thing to do probably. Okay. So to get a common denominator here, uh, Connor asks, can we multiply the numerator by x and the denominator by x. Can we do that? Can you multiply the numerator and denominator by the same thing? Yes, because what is x divided by x? One. It's one, so we're multiplying by one. Can you multiply a number by one? Yes. Does it change anything? No. Nothing but the way it looks. It doesn't change what it's worth. Okay, so we can multiply it by x over x, big deal. We did it. Is that a good thing to do? Gotta do it the other side. So to this guy right here, we'll multiply this by what? X plus h. X plus h. Can we do that? 
Yeah. Sure we can. We can multiply the numerator denominator by anything we want. So the limit as h approaches 0. Uh, this is a good, oh boy. x approaches 0, h approaches 0, excuse me, uh, of what is now x over x times x plus h minus x plus h times 1 over x times x plus h. Okay? So we multiply the two fractions by some stuff. Did that help us out? Yes. Yeah. In what way? We have common denominators. We have common denominators, and now we can combine these using subtraction. So now we get the limit. Uh, you could, but that would undo the work we just did, isn't it? Sure. Isn't that that? Okay. So 1 over h uh, times, now we get x minus x minus h. Remember, you're subtracting that entire numerator, not just the front part of it. So minus x minus h over x times x plus h. Uh, this is nice. These cancel out x minus x is 0. We have 0 minus h, which is negative h. So we can cancel out this h and this h. So, right? They're multiplying, yes. cross, cross cancel like that. So now we have uh, the limit as h approaches 0 of negative 1 over x times x plus h. Okay. And then what do we do? Plug in zero for it. Right. Once we've what the thing is, when we try to put zero in, in originally, here's our problem: we get one over zero. We don't like dividing by zero. Can't divide by zero. Now that problem has gone, and now the substitution part most likely happened. Um, so definitely give it a shot. So we have no, negative one. Negative one over x squared. X squared. X times x. Huh. C. 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 There we are. We're, we're only a couple sections in, really, and uh, we can answer questions 10 and most of 27 from the AP test, right? the big deal at the end of the year. Do we get AP credit for this class? Like on uh, day? It's a weighted class. Okay. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. Uh, we should talk to, uh, I know Ms. Holden has been doing this a long time, though she's in elementary. Uh, Ms. Williams is, is now a high school counselor. Ask them the exact difference between uh, AP calculus and calculus, right? Or weighted, if you don't know what weighted is. Um, but it is weighted, even though it's not an a AP class. AP is really, it's really all about me, right? I've been indoors to teach an AP class. That's all it's about. Uh, kind of saying, like, Board of the, the college board, the people who make the AP tests and the ACTs uh, and, the, and, the and the SATs, I believe. Um, they say, this guy's good. He's got a good plan. We looked at it. We think it's going to go well. That kind of thing. But you can take the AP test at the end of the year. Get AP, you can get credit for taking that class uh, in college. Okay. Um, all that's done. So we're going to continue on. We've got your quizzes. How big is the AP test? Let's just do it like how many questions? 68 pages? Uh, 68 pages? Three days to complete. Uh, what is wrong? <laughs> <laughs> it's three hours long. It has. Oh gosh. I think it's. It has. I'm going to have to get back to you on the exact numbers, but something around. Choice, which are challenging, don't look the multiple choice for you. And uh, then the free response where you gotta show all your work and people actually get together in hotels together and, and a big group of calculus teachers and professors are assigned number four. And they all grade number four from the free response. So it's all uniform and everybody gets the same uniform grade. Um, Have you ever gotten the grade off? No, sounds fun. <laughs> 
So, this idea of continuity is uh, pretty intuitive. You can, you can get it, you can recognize when you see it. Okay, we're going to define it. All right? We're going to define it using one-sided limits. All right? right now, a limit is definition. Uh, what about the definition of a limit is two-sided? Approaching from the left and the right. Yes, approaching from the left and the right. So it's from the left and from the right, they're approaching the same value, we have a limit. So the limit exists if uh, f of x gets arbitrarily close. This is also an informal definition. Um, it's arbitrarily close to L as uh, x approaches c uh, from the left and right. So let's just draw a pretty simple picture of what that might look like. Here's the function. Here is, uh, let's not even set a point there, let's just put a C value right there. Okay. Does the limit exist at C? Yeah. Yes. yes, it does, because as we look from the right and from the left, the graph is approaching, let's call it L. The graph is approaching that value, the function is approaching that value from the left and from the right. Okay. So however that looks, whether one side is coming down, one side is coming up, they could uh, both be coming up to that place right there. Right? Uh, so both, both sides could be coming up to that y value, could be coming down, whatever. Okay. So now, rather than just like loosely talking about from the left and from the right. We're going to give those each their own names. Um, we'll do this one in red. Okay. So on the green side, this is the limit as x approaches c. And what's that little guy right there? It's a negative sign. And which side are we on? Left. Does it make sense that this would represent from the left? Yes. From the left side. From the side where you will eventually find negative numbers, right? From the left side. Negative numbers on the left. Okay, this guy right here. Oh, I should have finished that up. F of x. Okay. What is the limit as x approaches c from the left of f of x in this picture? What is that limit from the left? Um, it is L. Any guesses as to what I'm about to put right here? A plus, plus sign. And what is that limit from the right? L. L. Okay. So another way we can define a limit, that a limit exists, is using the left and right limits. How could we use the left and right limits to rewrite the definition of a limit? Or the, the existence of a limit? Yeah. That's if a limit doesn't exist. What I'm saying is, how can we use the terminology of the left-handed limit, the limit from the left, and the right-handed limit, the limit from the right, uh, and redefine whether or not a limit exists, or, or define, state how we know the limit exists. Right now, we know the limit exists if, we, if it approaches uh, the same value from the right and from the left. But now we have these limits that actually equal That's if it doesn't exist, right? So okay. Oh, it gets closer to the points. Uh. Both sides. I think I see where you're going, and I, I know my question isn't the easiest to answer, right? And C negative approaches C positive. Okay. So if let's say that um, 
obviously the limit as x approaches c. Just the limit, not the right-handed limit or the left-handed limit, but the limit of f uh, exists if the limit as x approaches c from the left, uh, let's say not even it exists, let's be a little bit stronger than that, we'll say like equals l, if the limit as x approaches c from the left of f of x is what? L. L. And what else? The limit as x approaches c positive approaches the left. Uh -huh. The right-handed limit, the right-sided limit of f of x is also L. So if both limits, the left-handed limit and the right-handed limit, equal the same thing, the limit is that thing that they both equal. That's just another way of saying what we've already said, isn't it? Yeah. 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 It approaches the same thing from the left and from the right, um, but now we have this, this notion of a left-handed limit and a right-handed limit. Okay. Let's continue on from there. So not only can we redefine uh, a limit um, or, or state conditions for, for which uh, a limit can exist, uh, we can define continuity um, let's see, at a point C, okay. Function is continuous at a point C uh, if, let's put it in the same, F of C is defined, okay. What would it look like if, if F of C wasn't defined? There could be a hole. That's one thing that. Uh, there could be an asymptote. Right? The graph just ceases to exist at that point. Or, you know, maybe we're outside the domain of the function. Right? Like we're we're somewhere where the function doesn't exist. But what this means is that there is a y value associated with that x value. It does exist. It is defined. Okay. Um, is that enough? Can we just set the condition that f of c must be defined, and that, that would force any function that meets this criteria to be continuous. You can, could you come up, maybe you could uh, change this function a little bit uh, so that it is defined, but it's not continuous at c. Can All you need is a y value at c, but to draw a function that's not continuous at c. How do you draw a hole in it? Okay, so we'll erase this and we could go like that, put a hole. Okay, right now it's not defined, but we could put the definition of the function to be up there. And so now it is defined, but clearly it's not continuous. So there's an example of, you need, only need is one counter example. This is not enough for a function to be defined as continuous at C. Okay, so there's gotta be this. So there's got to be more to it. The limit as X approaches C of F of X must exist, it exists. Okay. Let's look at this function. The limit, or the F of C is defined. Does the limit exist at C? No. No, we don't have the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit equal to the same thing. Okay. Can someone think of a way to draw this function so that it's both defined at C and that the limit exists? Yeah. What if you have a circle? A circle, well, the circle wouldn't be a function. Right, two outputs for one input. You wanna draw it? Sure. A function that is defined at C, the limit exists at C, but it's not continuous.
condition is basically like fixing the problem that Aaron is pointing out. This, this point that's defined at C needs to be the limit, right? It needs to be the limit that exists. The limit needs to be the same as that point. That's what we say here. Uh, F of C, the point that is defined, needs to be equal to the limit as X approaches C uh, F of X. So if those, two, there's those three conditions are met, then what do we say about the function at C? It's continuous. So just kind of move this guy down here. We oh, fix it. Well. Yeah. Just going to stretch the leg. Yeah, I have to. Okay. I don't know. I was just wondering if you were just going to dance in. Just, mm -hmm. just take a few laps. Uh, 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 um, OK. And that, by the way, just um, by our luck, this function right here is discontinuous. right? But I can fix that really easily by putting a point right there where the hole is. Now there is no. Now there's no discontinuity. Okay? So that kind of discontinuity, the discontinuity with a hole, is called removable discontinuity, which I think is odd. So I don't remove anything to fix it, I put something there to fix it. Wait. Hmm. Oh well. But you're removing the discontinuity. You are removing the discontinuity. That's true. You are getting it out of there. You're removing that aspect of that function. Uh, but I think it's just kind of. I would call it like a fillable discontinuity. Fill it in. I I wasn't there that day when they made that up. So that's what we have. Removable discontinuity. Uh, just put that in a little thought bubble here. Okay. This kind of discontinuity. Discontinuity is called removable. Did I? Did we Song. Call we're just saying oh, okay. that. Okay. <laughs> called removable. It's called removable discontinuity. Okay. <clears throat> well. What kind of a function could be discontinuous at a point, but it's not the kind of discontinuity that's removable? Uh, how could we have uh, a function that is like it's, uh, it exists on this interval, but at some point it's not continuous? And not only is it not continuous, that discontinuity is not a whole. It's not removable. Aaron. Aaron. What? What did I what? No, not call me Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm that good. If there's no limit. Okay. So I'm at the line this. Um There's a possibility. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that's an example of of a non removable discontinuity, that's true. Uh non Here's an example. The limit doesn't exist, so like this. Yeah. Is that jump? Yeah, that's that's a discontinuity, and you can't fix it by filling in a hole. What's another one? Uh, what about the that? The uh, hang on, hang on. I'll let you know what that is. Dr. Connor. Is that what you just said? Never mind. <laughs> so uh, a vertical asymptote. Is another kind of uh, remo non removable discontinuity. Okay. Well, there's some examples of some non removable discontinuity.
And we will now I want you to pay close attention to this. Because there are questions on the AP test that will rely on your knowledge of the definition of this continuity of, of, of continuity. Okay? And it is this. This is the definition. Function has to meet these three criteria to be continuous. And they are crafty, they're smart, and they can ask a question in such a way that you must bring into it the definition, the three parts of the definition of, this, of, of continuity. Defined so far is uh, a function that's continuous at a particular point. So, if we would talk about a function that's discontinuous, uh, we wouldn't say the function is discontinuous. Is, is this function in general a discontinuous function? No. If you lied one time, just once. <laughs> And I said, you're a liar. You're a bad person. Do you feel that be fair? No. Yeah. It's like calling this function discontinuous. Calling it a discontinuous function. Like be calling you a liar for saying that you, I don't know, something small. Well, I'm not sure what you would lie about, but whatever. You have to go Well, let me, let me just point out what I'm, I'm really talking about. Is it, is it continuous between those two points? Yes. Yes. On that interval, is it continuous? Yes. Yeah, so it's not a discontinuous function. It's just discontinuous at that point. Yeah. It's discontinuous at C, right? So, discontinuity. so we would say it's discontinuous there, it's discontinuous there, discontinuity at a point. Not everywhere, not the whole function, just at a point. Okay? So, then we want to find uh, intervals, spans, where there is no discontinuity. Right? So we would want to define from A to B, it's continuous all throughout there. Okay. Uh, so, um, let's see. Well, this is just on page 73. Uh, but I'll write it up here. So a function is continuous. It's continuous on okay. This a comma b with these square brackets is an interval. What kind of interval is it? Closed. Closed. Yes, it's closed. Okay. Because it includes a and b. Okay. Um, so the function is continuous on the closed interval a to b if it is continuous on the open interval from a to b. Okay, what does that mean? Huh? Yeah, what does the open interval mean? Not including not including a and b. Okay, and what would that mean to you if you were to say that it's continuous on that entire open interval? Between A and B, there's no points of discontinuity. Right? Every point on there meets those three criteria that we talked about. Uh, uh, if, okay, the, so A is clearly on the left, B is on the right. So the limit as X approaches A from the right of F of X is equal to what do you think that has to be equal to in order for it to be? Don't just look at it and read it to me, please. I want you to think with your brains. Should be equal to B. Uh, well, this limit is a, is a Y value. Okay, so we'll, here, I'll draw a picture of a function like this. And here's A. And here's B. 
So it, it's all nice and continuous everywhere uh, in between A and B. But at, exactly at A, what can happen at that point? Huh? Could be at a different place somewhere. Yeah, we could have like a hole and then a, a circle up there, right? Okay. So this would, we can't have a hole and a circle up there. The, the actual value of the function and the limit would have to be the same. So how would you express the value of the limit here? F of A. It would have to be equal to F of A. And the limit as X approaches B from the left of F of X would have to be equal to F of B. Now, there are these properties of continuity, and I'm actually going to do this. This file that I nice TA for me. Was it Connor? No. Oh. Yeah, it was. Oh. Mm -hmm. So these, uh, these properties of continuity, which, just like the properties of limits, they're fairly intuitive and not surprising. Um, if, if a function is continuous on an interval, on a closed interval, um, or, yeah, well, either way. If a function is continuous at a point, then if you multiply that function by a constant, it's still going to be continuous there. Multiplying it by a constant is not going to put a hole or a vertical asymptote or any other kind of discontinuity into that function. It's just going to make it five times taller, five times steeper. Um, some difference, if you add two functions that are continuous at f and g, it's still going to be continuous after you, or at c. If you add the functions f and g, which are both continuous at c, the, the result is going to be still continuous. Multiplying two functions together, still going to be continuous. The quotient's going to be continuous just as long as the denominator isn't zero. So as long as g of c isn't, uh, you know, it's nice and it's continuous and all that kind of stuff, but as long as it's not equal to zero, then you can divide two functions, which are continuous, and the result is also continuous. The same it can be said, not just of combinations of functions in that way, but of composite functions. If you compose two functions together, then the result is also going to be continuous. I'm not really saying anything about what the, the other properties of this function would be, what the values would be, or anything like that. It's just saying that the, the, the new function will still be continuous if the original functions were continuous.
going to talk about something called the intermediate value theorem. It's the last thing in this section. Um, so, say there's a, a, a rock climber. And there's a rock for him to climb. This rock climber is going to climb up one day, Ooh. and on the next day, he might imagine he's going to climb down. Okay. On the first day, he starts, let's say, at 8 a.m. <laughs> and uh, so he, he starts out down here at 8 a.m. That's him down there. And then let's say at 5 p.m., he moves at the top. Could you imagine it? Yes. You got it. Okay. Well, the next day, at exactly 8 a.m., he's up here. Okay? And he starts to climb down. Do it again. <laughs> right. And by 5 p.m., exactly. Same time he got to the top the day before, he's now at the bottom. Incredible. Wow. Incredible. Okay? So at 8 a.m. on the first day, he's way down here. At 8 a.m. on the second day, he's way up here, right? Mm -hmm. Not at the same place. And at 5 p.m. on the first day, he's at the top. At 5 p.m. on the second day, he's at the bottom. What I want you to talk about amongst yourselves is whether or not there comes a point. Uh, say, and you don't have to find the exact time, but does there exist a point where, say, just for example, at 12.05, he is at exactly the same height on day one as he is on day two. It doesn't have to be 12.05, but does there exist a time, it could be 12.05, where he's at exactly the same height, exact same height, exact same time of day on both days? Right. We're taking into account when he's going uphill and downhill, or it's just like we're taking into account everything that it takes to climb a mountain. Okay. Okay. So it would be the only things that we know is that it's eight exactly. a.m. to five p.m. It shouldn't be. So, so is it a guarantee? Is it a guarantee that at some point on both no. days will be the no. same height? Discuss together. Why? Why not? Do you want to join our discussion? Yes, I would love to join your discussion. Okay. So. So yeah, we're taking into account that he's going down. You can't get that. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll you can't get that. That's the first answer I'm asking for discussion. Yeah. 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 Yeah, but well, he marked down. He stood could, there for 15 minutes. Yeah, you really wanted to pass the main goal. Like, like, when you hide at 8, eight you can be like, I want to reach this point at this time. Okay, it's not going to be a problem. Another way to think of it is, could he possibly avoid this happening? Could he plan his two trips in such a way that he could avoid this happening? Where he has access to Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's, 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 your stance is then that there isn't a point guaranteed. There isn't a time guaranteed. He's at the exact same height. There could no. be a coincidence where he was. But there's no he guarantee. Could be a coincidence. He could plan to. You could play, he could plan either way. But there's no, yeah. but there's no guarantee. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, why, what evidence do you have that convinces you that there's no guarantee? Because you might be tired from climbing the first day, so you can go a little bit slower. Okay, but at, at some point, but he does all, he does end at the same he begins and he ends at the same time. And you go yeah. fat like you go faster going downhill because uh -huh. you don't get like as tired as much uh -huh. as going uphill. So he could have just been like really tired from the day before he came on sore, just stoked up, you know, didn't want to move. <laughs> and he does have to get all the way down that mountain by five. He does do it. Yeah. Maybe he sprints the downhill parts and, like and really slowly walks the uphill parts. Okay. 
and, and, and don't pay too much attention to the up and downness of my drawing. Okay, it could be straight up, whatever, however you want it to look like. Yeah. Okay. Oh, if it was straight up. If it was like a flat line, like completely flat, and you walk the same pace up the way there and the way back, but it wouldn't you, be if the you same. If you walked the same pace and had all his same strides exactly the same, which that's what's necessary isn't to have very, first. as a human being, isn't really possible. Well, okay. it is possible, but it's not. Okay. Well, let me, let me put this to you. Okay, so you, you, you've got the scenario in your mind. You've got your opinions about it. Okay, I'm going to have you guys come up, um, one of you. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to draw a graph here. We're going to draw one graph on top of the other. First graph we'll call F, the other we'll call G. Okay, the graph F is related to the first day. Okay, F is for the first day. F, first day, climb, okay? And it'll be his height uh, and time. Height and time. Height has two eyes now. No. Height. H-E-I-G-H. Okay, well, it's not there anymore. It's going to be standing in front of it, so it doesn't exist. OK, uh, so you know, at time whatever, he's at height whatever. That's what this graph looks like. So here's 8 AM, and here's 5. Okay. So I want somebody to, you know, here's the bottom of the mountain, and here will be the top of the mountain. And I just want you to draw a reasonable graph. And Ryan was first. Ryan. Why are you seeing that right. board now? Ryan. Who's not that kind of I want you to draw a reasonable graph of his, his ascent of the mountain. Okay, reasonable or realistic? Uh, is that the same thing? Well, I mean, do you want to like, incorporate all that? Anything you down. want to imagine Realistics. could happen. See a bear. Unrealistic, realistic, whatever. Top of the hill right there. Well, okay. It's right to the top. So, uh, <laughs> if we were to be keeping with like the picture, that kind of goes with the picture. You're gonna go up some, you're gonna go down some, you're gonna go up some. No. Right, your elevation. No. no? Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Okay. Oh Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> like it? Okay. You eat dinner at dinner. Ah, you eat dinner at 2 p.m. Oh, yeah. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Very good. <laughs> so, and, and this should come like down <laughs> to the bottom, right? To the bottom part of this. All right. So here's now what I want to do. G will be in red, and it'll represent the second day. G will say his descent. Descent. Is that his about descent? Yes. Is that decent? No. Ooh, it's it's the same. No S. No. Oh, okay. So look it up. I don't think there's a C in there. Uh, oh, yeah. I think it's Sophie. No, I was asking if you wanted me to look up how to spell that word. Oh, oh it's yeah, sure. You wanna, okay, so here's where, where will this one start? The top. At the top. At 8 a.m., so that's at the top. Okay. And it'll end at the bottom. Okay? So I want you to draw a graph where. Now, let, let's just think about this. What's going to happen if, He's good. if your graph and your graph intersect? What will that tell us? That'll be the time where it's And same. sometime he's at the same height. So you go ahead and draw a graph where that doesn't happen. <laughs> oh my goodness. I hope. I understand the point of this now. <laughs> draw a graph where they don't cross. Because if they cross, He'll at some point be at the same height at the same exact time. Oh, you are all wrong. <laughs> Just go straight. straight, 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 straight. Yeah, that's but then he'll still be on the clock. So that is a scenario where he stays at the top of the mountain all day long and jumps to his death at the very end. <laughs> yeah. He still reaches the parachute. But at some point, it will have to have crossed the same place at the same time. What's that? Yeah. Right, but the thing is, it could be any point. It could be, you could make it happen anywhere, yeah, but it so will happen. It will happen. So if you do it, no. then just draw something. Not a cat. I'm going to grab one. Not a cat. <laughs> he just does pranks all around. Awesome. He's not going to eat anything all day. 
Okay, so you see my point there. Of course, there is some point at some time uh, that is the same exact height that he was the day before. We could draw these two graphs, as Sarah said, like any way we want to. Uh, and the point, the exact point, would be anywhere. It could be anywhere. Absolutely anywhere within this area. But uh, it will exist. That's the point. It exists. There comes the point. Imagine it this way. Imagine day three. Okay? That guy goes home. Two more uh, hikers show up. Uh, one at the bottom, and one is helicoptered in at the top. Okay? So one starts at the bottom, one starts at the top. And at 8 a.m., they both begin their journey, one going up, one going down. Right? Well, at some point during that day, if it's guaranteed that they'll get to their, to their destinations at 5 o'clock, will they have to pass each other? Yes. Yeah, and at that time, they'll be exactly the same place, exactly at the same time. Oh. Okay. Now, intermediate value theorem, intermediate value theorem says this kind of thing in a little bit of a different way. Because the intermediate value theorem is about one function, not two functions. Okay? So let's take this graph. Ooh. Shrink it down, like right there. What we're going to do over here is draw another graph, and it's going to be f, the green one, minus g. Ooh. Not a big deal. No, it doesn't have to be perfect. Let's get the general idea, okay? Uh, and we'll, we'll use this kind of as a guide. Okay, so here's f. f is zero at the beginning of the day. And g is the top, the absolute top. So f minus g is gonna give us what kind of a value? Negative. Negative. Just f minus g, not f minus g over two. Just f minus g, that's gonna be negative. Okay, let's go to the very end of the day. Uh, there's f all the way to the top, g all the way at the bottom, what's f minus g gonna be? And where? Up at the top. It's the top minus nothing, so it's going to be the top. All the way to the top. Right there. Okay. Um, well, for all these values over here, f minus g is going to be what? Negative. Negative, because f is smaller than g. Negative up until the intersection. And at the intersection, what will it be? Zero. Zero. Right? So, now, like we said before, we can draw f and g however we want. We could also, f and g could be whatever we want, and their subtraction, their, the difference of the two, could look however we want it to do. But here's what we know. It starts here, below zero, definitely. The difference between the two altitudes is definitely negative. And here it's definitely positive. And definitely it's continuous, right? Because one function that's continuous minus another function that's continuous is a continuous function, right? Pretty, pretty intuitive. Uh, so no matter what we do, However we graph this f minus g thing, what's going to happen? It's going to be continuous, but in, in the context of, of our question, it'll go through zero. There's no way to get around it. Right? We can see with the two graphs, we can do it with the imagination of the two people at the same time. Um, it's definitely going to cross zero at some point, and when it crosses zero, f minus g is zero, which means that f and g are worth the same thing, and therefore at that time they're at the same height. So, intermediate value theorem says a thing a lot like that. Uh, let f be continuous, continuous uh, on a to b. Um, Actually, you know what would be the easiest thing to do? Would be to get that scan. Just pull that in. Okay, so the intermediate value of theorem. the intermediate value theorem. 
if f is continuous, this function that we define, let's we could call it something else, right? Because we did use that already. But this function would be continuous uh, on the closed interval from, from a to b, and k is any number between f of a and f of b, right? So here's f of a down here. F of b is up there, and k is anything in between those two. Okay. So any value, any altitude between negative all the way to the top and positive all the way to the top. Um, so we could choose zero or any other height. Uh, so zero could be the, the thing that's between the two. So k is any number between f of a and f of b. Then there's at least one number, c, between a and b. So at least one place in between here where uh, f of c is equal to k. So here is an example. Here is a place where f of c is zero, which for the context of this problem means it's at the exact same height at the exact same time. Um, you guys need to go now? Yeah? Yeah, okay. Um, infinite limits is something we've actually already talked about, okay? This is 1.5. You remember that question we, uh, we had that came up That's your cookie factory. Yeah. There is a factory. Where? Can we see it? This guy right here. No, it's not this one. Yeah, it's a cookie factory. Yeah, cookie factory. Oh, there it is. Okay. There's a question we looked at the other day. Uh, Aaron led us in the, the answering of it and said, hey, the limit doesn't exist there. Clearly, they, they don't approach the same value. They're approaching infinity. There's no limit there. They're approaching different values. The limit exists on 3, but then we found that the answer did not include just 3 as an answer. We came to understand that it was 1 and 3, right? Part D. Right? And how did, we, how did we justify that? What is the limit here? Infinity. Yes, the limit as x approaches 3 of this function, we say is infinity. I could almost put quotes around that as if to mock it and say, it doesn't really equal infinity. You can't equal uh, a thing that's not a number, but that's what infinite limits are. It's calling a limit infinity when infinity is not a number. It's basically what it comes down to, okay? We talked about that. Um, we can have, um, yeah, we can have left-handed limits that go to infinity or negative infinity. We can have right-handed limits that go to infinity or negative infinity. Um, that's the idea of a, a limit at infinity, or infinite limits. Um, so where are you going to get these infinite limits? Asymptotes. At vertical asymptotes. How do you find vertical asymptotes? When do vertical asymptotes X equal zero. What does? No, no, zero is not. No, the denominator is zero. zero. Yeah, it increases without bound. If we're looking at the at the function, the actual like equation, then in the equation, the denominator will be zero. Always, when the denominator is zero, you get a vertical asymptote. No. no. What else could you get? A hole. You can get a hole if the numerator is also zero at the same time. Okay. So if we get the denominator is zero, while the numerator is not, then we'll have a vertical asymptote. So if we were to to look at a function and maybe. Uh, factor out the numerator and denominator, and we find a factor in the denominator that the numerator doesn't have, so they're not going to cancel, they're not going to be zero at the same time, so that factor that the denominator has that the numerator doesn't is going to cause a vertical asymptote. Um, um, five minutes, so we've got enough time to, to throw something at you here. Oh. Throw a, a, a practice problem.
Five and six shouldn't be that way. Wait, let me make sure we're looking at the same ones. Three and four. These two right here? Yeah. Those ones, okay. Uh, okay. They said they were who? Back to the left. Well, there's no answer for four in the back. Three. So for three, they're saying there's no limit? Oh. <laughs> okay. I, I figured that's probably what I'm going um, it's okay, Pat. Just forget it. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Ben. Okay. Um, oh, sit down, Tyne, and stretch my legs. Put your backpack on. Let's see a weight training. Um, well. But let's see if any problems come up. I think you'll be fine with the infinite limits. But I do want to mention this while we still have time. Um, so I have these two books. Uh, this chapter is one through six, I think. It doesn't say. I think it's one through six and then seven through the end of the book. These are full worked out solutions. Not just the answers, but step by step yeah. what they did. OK, now, uh, you're free. It will be right here. You're free to come in and use it, OK? I can come into my room, you have to use it, uh, and here is how, I can't make you use it this way. I can't make you come in here and borrow it from me, but here's what I advise, that you don't look at it too quickly, that you try the problem, do as much as you can, try everything you can think of, even if you get run into a hundred different dead ends, and when you're completely out of ideas, not when most of you, like 99% of you say, I have no idea, that's not true. You do have some idea. Exhaust every idea you have, okay? Maybe you get two steps into it where you're pretty confident, and then through step three, you really don't know what to do. Make a guess at step three, even. Then look at the solution, okay? It'll stick way better. It'll actually take way less time and be in your brains even more significantly than if you just look at it, do it, get the homework done. I can't stop you from doing that. You're almost grown ups. Okay. Some of you maybe are 18 and you could go fight in the war or vote or all those sorts of things. So I'll trust you with the solutions manual. Um, so it exists and you can just come in and you can grab it and sit down and use it. Not just a minute. Have a seat. Give me whenever. If you have a class. Yep. Whenever. And just like roll on up there and be Roll on up and take it. Delta X? It's like H. You know how we use H a lot? It is just a variable. Delta X together as a whole. Good. Probably. Good. 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 Good.